So we're going to switch um, modes a little bit going forward. We're going to um, next be hearing a presentation from Kelly and George. And they are with the BRE Trust. And I'm sorry if I'm if it's it's actually a name, Bree as opposed to BRE. And WWF US with the Global Shelter Cluster Environment Community of Practice. And they've been developing a tool to assess the carbon dioxide equivalent of basic construction plans. And I think it's super interesting to think about the carbon dioxide equivalent or CO2 as a common measurement for the environmental footprint and as a mode of measuring carbon reaction reduction efforts. So what we're gonna see in this tool, which is called the Shelters Material Assessment for Carbon or SMAC, and it's primarily designed for emergency and transitional shelters, but it can be used for other types of basic construction, including schools or clinics or markets or community buildings. And George is going to be doing the presentation for us. And then Kelly's going to come and explore some of the applications for the camp management and camp coordination um, practitioners like ourselves. And there will be time for questions and answers at the beginning, uh, excuse me, at the end. So Kelly, I'm wondering if you are going to be sharing your screen or if George is, and if you can go ahead, put your presentation up. Hi, George. Hi, uh, George. Yeah, I'll, I'll be uh, sharing the screen. Yeah. Great. So hopefully you should be able to see now. Yeah, if you can just put it into presentation mode. Seems like you're like, yep, great, looks good. Great, okay, thank you everyone. Um, hello, hi, yeah, so um, I'm George Foden. Um, I'm from the BRE Trust uh, and I'm presenting the, uh, today with, with uh, Kelly. We're gonna be talking about the tool that we've been developing, looking at life cycle analysis to assess the carbon footprint of humanitarian shelter options. Um, some of you may have heard of this tool before. We've been doing the rounds a little bit, talking about, uh, about the SMAC tool. Um, but what I'll do quickly now is run through the, 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 the process and, and how the tool works and then hand over to Kelly. We'll talk a little bit more about its relevance to, to the camp coordination and camp management side of things as well. So um, as, as uh, we, we mentioned, we were looking at considering life cycle assessment uh, and measuring CO2 equivalents uh, in shelter materials and shelter methodologies. And what we really wanted to do was create something that was a cradle to grave uh, measurement, a methodology that looked at the whole life cycle of the shelter materials that were being used um, and allow for consideration of the global environmental impact that, that different shelter materials and different shelter methods could be having. Um, the, the methodology that we, that we developed is, is it gives an output that's measured in CO2 equivalent emissions. Um, this obviously is a very complicated thing, the environmental impact of, of shelter materials, but we wanted to provide a metric that could be used to compare different shelter typologies um, in terms of the level of impact that they're having and create something that was quite easy as a comparative metric to use. So what we're hoping is that this tool can be used to feed into decision making, looked at the greening of operations, thinking about how we can reduce the carbon footprint of the materials that are being used and the methodologies that are being used um, in terms of our, our shelter types. And the idea behind that is that hopefully at the end, you'll have a, an improved shelter product um, and better informed decision making when it comes to thinking about environmental impact. And this kind of came about as a result of the update to the, to the sphere standards in, in 2018 and the particular new focus on reducing environmental impacts uh, in the response. Uh, particularly Sphere Shelter Standard 7, which, which was looking at um, one of the indicators was the percentage of shelter construction uh, materials that were using low carbon emission construction materials and methods. Um, and so we wanted to create something that could allow comparison between different shelter typologies in terms of the level of carbon impact that they're having. So the, the tool itself um, has been developed from a pre-existing tool that BRE had previously developed uh, called LIST that was designed for shop fit out. Um, and what we really wanted to do was, was use something that 
have been tried and tested. This is the methodology that's working. It's it's available in kind of a, a, um, a different sector. And so we knew that this, this process worked and we just wanted to adapt this to make it applicable to, to humanitarian, to the humanitarian sector and to shelter construction uh, materials more generally, with the idea being that this provides a very simple metric that can be used to inform and support decision making at all stages of the of the shelter process from kind of procurement um, design and, and consideration of, of the type of shelter materials that might be used, and even through to, to things like upgrading shelters, retrofitting and things like that as well. So um, to actually use SMAC itself, we wanted to create something that was easy and quick to use, a non-expert methodology. So it's an Excel-based tool. Um, hopefully it's something that you can just pick up and use. Um, and I'll give you a quick walkthrough of, of, of how that works. But basically, in order to use the tool, you need very simple information that should be found on a bill of quantities for shelter specifications. So you need information on the component materials, the packaging materials, and the transportation distances and methods. Um, and if you have that information available to you, um, there's some calculations that go on in the background that look at end of life considerations as well. And that's everything that you need for, for, for the output that the, that the tool will provide. And, and, and as I mentioned, the, the hope is that this is an easy to use tool, something that can very quickly be um, used to get a very quick output that you can, that you can factor into decision making. Um, so in order to use the SMAC tool, you start off with the component materials, and this is a simple drop down menu um, that you can choose the materials that are being used. So in the yellow boxes there, you go through the drop down list and select the materials that, you, that, that are going into the shelter. Um, and then underneath that, you can see the green cells that are uh, for the material quantity in kilograms. And if you know the materials that are being used and the quantity, that's all you need to put in for the component materials section of the tool. You do the same for, for the packaging materials that, that, that the shelter components come in. And then into some information on the transportation of, of, of the different materials. So we have that broken down into different stages from the country of origin to the point of arrival in country, um, from the point of arrival to, to the warehouse or storage point, and from there to the construction site and eventually onto disposal. Um, and you can choose the different methodologies of transport as well, and that will affect the, the eventual output. And as you can see on the bottom there, the end of life calculations are done based on the information that you put in above. You don't need to worry about any of that. That's all calculations that are done within the tool. And then these are the sorts of outputs that you can um, get from the tool. So in this example, we're comparing three different shelter types. Uh, on the left-hand side there, you can see that from the three specifications that we've put into the tool, shelter specification two is, has, has a much higher uh, CO2 equivalent impact than shelters one or three. So that might be something that would be flagged in, in kind of your decision making process or your procurement process. If you're looking at these different shelter types and going, actually, there's, there's something significantly uh, different about what we're doing with, with shelter two than we are with the other two. Um, so maybe it's better to choose shelter one or three. Um, but also if you wanted to do to see more of a breakdown about why shelter specification two has so much more impact that's what you can see on the right hand side there. This is the CO2 impact breakdown percentage per unit. And so what you can immediately see on specification two there is that transport, the yellow uh, part of the bar, is accounting for looks about 90% of the impact of, of, the, of, of the shelter specification itself. Um, so the one thing that you really want to address in specification two there is transport. If you were to look back at the data that we've, that we've put into the tool, what you'd probably find is that uh, all of these shelters, for the sake of the example, are being manufactured in the in the US and shipped to Europe, so they're traveling the same distance. Um, but the transport method for specification two is via air. Um, this is a sort of a post event uh, emergency shipping of uh, emergency transport materials, um, and so it's being flown over. Whereas in the other two specifications, we're maybe using a ship, uh, and so. Therefore, the transport impact is, is, is much less in those two than it would be in, in specification two. And so making decisions about the transport is something that can be considered um, that may well reduce shelter specification two down to the levels that you see shelters one and three are at. And you can also see on shelter specification three there that quite a large chunk of the percentage of, of impact is coming from packaging. You wouldn't expect necessarily for there to be that much of an impact from the packaging. So what you might be able to look at is say actually we're using a lot of plastic maybe we can change the type of packaging we're using or reduce the amount. 
and that's something that will that will lower the impact of shell specification free even more so those are the sorts of decisions that you can hopefully make using this tool so just uh quickly to, to sort of wrap up this presentation before i hand over to kelly looking at kind of the next steps of the tool this is something that's going to be available for testing very soon it will be out uh, this week to, to be able to, to start for people to start to play around with and see how it works. If you're interested in trialing the, the first version of the tool, then you can reach out to, to Kelly or to Stephen Alexander, who's one of my colleagues who's been leading on the, the, the more technical side of, of the development of the tool, um, and they can share more information with you as that becomes available. As I said, the tool is looking at, at, at supporting decision making. And so one of the things that we did uh, alongside this was we we, we co-authored a chapter in interactions roadmap for research that came out a couple of weeks ago looking at what we're calling an environmental balanced scorecard approach looking at the different elements of environmental impact and how some of these different metrics can be weighed up against each other in terms of their importance in order to inform decision making um, so if you're looking for more information on, on how this could be used in decision making then that's a, a good place to start and we're also using this, as we said, it's an Excel based tool. Um, and the idea is that it's an open source tool. So we've used open source data. You can find data points of where we've, where we've um, found the information that goes into the tool, where we've developed the, the CO2 equivalent impact measures that are in the tool. All of that's open access using open access databases with the idea being that this tool can be built on in the future and developed further. Um, so there's potential to add new materials, look at more types of packaging, look at other uh, elements of, of shelter action like non-food items, uh, and also start to think about some of the considerations that might go into camp coordination and camp management issues. Um, and so that's it for the presentation. And I think at this point, I'm going to hand over to Kelly to, to talk a little bit more about how this might be relevant to, to, to those of you on the call today. So thank you very much. Thanks a lot, George. Um... A couple, one thing that <clears throat> I should mention also that in addition to the tool itself, uh, BRE has uh, developed a set of training guidance, uh, PowerPoint presentations, and a um, recorded module to explain how to use it, although it's considered to be very simple. Of course, we need the training guidance, so that'll be available. Um, and also uh, contacting uh, myself or Stephen for support is, is also an option. So CO2 equivalent or CO2 EQ or CO2 E, um, which we talk about uh, as the focus of this tool is one of the points of reference in terms of uh, carbon reduction, uh, climate change issues. So to become carbon neutral or carbon negative, you need to understand how much uh, your efforts, humanitarian efforts or other efforts are putting into um, generating carbon. And so that is the focus of this tool. It's related to the sphere standards and the shelter standards. What we're doing is applying a uh, private sector tool used in the construction industry and adapting it to the humanitarian sector. So it's not a cold start effort. It's This is something where there's a lot of experience behind the tool itself. Um, where we want to emphasize it for the camp management, um, camp coordination area uh, is that this could be relevant as well for schools, clinics, markets, anything else within a camp that's being constructed. Um, and so it's really based on a bill of quantities uh, as a starting point so you have a you decide to build a school for instance and you have a bill of quantities and you, you just input that data into the tool so it's not just for shelter although that was the focus point where we started um, so for anything built within a within a, a camp or, or a camp setting uh, this tool can be used for that that uh, that purpose it's useful for planning anticipating what you might have in terms of impacts and then actually in operations saying okay we've we've got money to go ahead and do something now we, we want to look at what our options are so uh, both planning and, and actual implementation. Uh, the tool can be used in the CCM cluster approach. The tool can be used both to provide guidance to individual organizations that are doing things within a camp. So an organization comes in and says, we want to build schools. And the, the camp coordination uh, team can say, oh, by the way, you may want to use this tool to look at your CO2 equivalent. Um, so the other option is that if, if um, there is funding provided to the overall uh, camp management process or the camp managers, uh, this tool can be used actually in the design of, of specific buildings and, and consideration of those kinds of things. Uh, so it's, it's actually a planning tool and a technical tool. We want to expand its use beyond uh, construction to look at, for instance, first of all, NFIs, non-food items. Uh, so that's sort of a next step that we want to look at, which might be interested of interest to uh, CCCM uh, cluster members. 
Uh, and we'll be hopefully doing that as the next phase of the process. This is, as, as Sir George pointed out, part of a broader approach to looking at environmental footprint of, of humanitarian assistance. And it really fits within what we call a scorecard approach. So one of the issues, for instance, is uh, the difference between procuring locally, which reduces your transport CO2 equivalent, as opposed to procuring um, at a distance and bringing in things using transport. Uh, the idea of procuring locally may be very good, but the scorecard approach uh, would allow you to understand whether procuring locally would actually damage the environment locally. So that's sort of, again, a next step that we're looking at is using the scorecard approach, which is currently used in the private sector. And I want to emphasize that this is one of several efforts that are ongoing. So this is not the only one. The USAID is looking at packaging, ICRC, and a group of uh, associated organizations are looking at uh, much broader issues about uh, carbon. Uh, UNHCR has done some uh, very good work on uh, shelter and sustainability, a book uh, that they've produced. And the universities in Bath, Northwestern, Penn State, in Finland, as well as the uh, logistics cluster and a number of others are looking at this kind of issue. Um, so we want to emphasize that this isn't the only thing out there. There are a lot of other things and sort of the use depends on, on what you're doing and, and uh, what resources you have and, and time that you have. And I also want to emphasize that once the tool is available, we'll publicize it through the cluster um, CCCM and also the shelter cluster and make it available to everybody. There are two versions. One is the usable, the operational version, and the other is a, um, the, um, the back office version where we can make changes to uh, add materials or change some of the indicator, the data that's used to define the CO2 equivalents of materials. So we'll be developing the tool over time as well uh, with updates and depending on field input. Thank you very much. Thanks, Kelly and, and George. Um, I was looking at the, at the chat and <clears throat> I see a question from from Omar talking about kind of um, fire safety in addition to being environmentally friendly. And I don't know if you have any reflections on that that you'd like to share um, just from your own kind of technical experience or if you want to point out where in the tool that could kind of be considered. So we haven't, we didn't consider incorporate fire um, vulnerability of fire or, or ability to be combusted as an indicator. It is something that can be defined um, quantitatively. Uh, things have ignition points, ignition points, and that and that's that's known data. Um, I would refer more of that discussion over to um, something that in the shelter cluster has been funded, which is a, a project looking at uh, fire safety in camps. Um, because it's not only the materials in the shelter itself, but also the whole overall camp management in terms of fire safety. So that's again something we can consider putting into the tool um, at a next at the next step because that the combustibility or the ignition point is something that's a defined um, element. Thanks a lot. I'm just, I'm just looking at another question that's yeah. come up into the chat from Shane, and I'm not sure if you can see it either, but he's asking, does the tool consider lifespan of the shelter construction? I mean, maybe George, that's part of your you know shelter you know, cradle to grave uh, metaphor there that you were using. And if you could kind of elaborate on Shane's question. Go ahead, George. Yeah, so um, so it's not, I mean, so when you're filling out the information and, and within the tool, one of the the, the options that, that's there is to put in the expected lifespan of the of the shelter type. I mean, obviously one of the things that, that we find is that any expected lifespan often isn't the length of time that that those materials are actually used as a shelter. So, um, you know, we can kind of give a, a rough idea of, of how long it's expected to last. As I said, this tool itself is, is intended for, at, at, the, at the moment with the materials that we have in it, it's very much looking at kind of the, 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 the emergency or transitional shelter types. Um, one of the things that we did talk about early on was having a, a comparison based on the different lifespans and seeing obviously if, if one shelter scores much lower in terms of its CO2 equivalent impact than another, but one is supposed to be there for six months and the other is supposed to be there for two years, then it may well be that over that length of time, actually it makes sense to go for the one with the higher score if that's not going to need to be replaced. Um, so that's not something that you can necessarily see in the outputs in terms of the graphs and things that we currently have, um, but it is something that you can mention in your different shelf specifications and it will appear on the results page as a reminder of you know this shelter actually maybe it scores better but it's not intended to, to last for as long 
Um, so that's a consideration that's there. And maybe as the tool develops, or maybe a, as kind of a next step might be to add in graphs that show that more clearly and kind of draw attention to that fact. Um, so it's, it, it's a consideration, but it's not necessarily one of the key ones that's, that's currently there. And uh, just to elaborate on that, as I mentioned, sure, Kelly, um, go ahead. Other organizations have actually done research on this. The University of Bath has developed a typology of, I think, 50 different types of shelters. Um, and, and one of the issues that they've highlighted in the research is that it makes more sense to build a permanent shelter as the initial response than, re, than coming in with temporary shelters or transitional shelters and continually having to upgrade them. And that's, that's a, a useful point to, to make because um, oftentimes the initial response is a very short-term response, but the, res the overall shelter and settlements challenge is a long-term one. And, and so looking at those things, not only this tool, but other research and other tools can be used for that. Uh, the one thing I want to point out is that the, the bath work, for instance, has 50 different types of shelters. Uh, but what we wanted to have was something that was very flexible uh, that could be used on the ground um, in somebody's office using Excel on a computer uh, to play with uh, different shelter options or different construction options, I should say, not just shelter construction options, so that there's a, a, a better input into the local decision making and local understanding of what the issues that they may be facing. So sort of a bit of localization in the process rather than having it done someplace else with uh, people who are not necessarily what, aware of what's happening on the ground. Okay, so a question that's occurred to me, and I don't see it in the in the chat yet, but are you actively seeking places to pilot, or are you, um, do you already have places in mind, and and kind of how have you? Uh, we want used we it? want people to send us emails saying yes, we want to try to do this. <laughs> okay, so CCCMers out there, if you're interested in using this, I think this is a, an, a call to action right now, and. I just wanted to plug the minimum standards for camp management because it's what I do. Um, but it, it would be interesting for us to think about that from a camp management standpoint in relationship to uh, standard 3.1 and 3.2, which looks at safety and security of the environment. And we've defined those things very much based on the population's definitions of um, how, to, how to make better site maintenance or site improvement plans. But it would be nice to incorporate some of the environmental impact um, kind of similar to what uh, Celeste was saying further up in the chat to make sure that environment was kind of um, also looking at kind of the wider environmental impact of, of settlements and, and their duration of the site. So I think that that's, that's very interesting. Um, I see that you've shared your link in the chat and you have a few more minutes for your presentation. You, you scheduled yourself for 30 minutes. So if you want to take um, one or two more one or two more questions or, or elaborate on anything. No, I, I mean, for me, it's just to give everybody in the camp management camp coordination uh, sector an understanding of what we're what we've developed uh, so that there's not over expectation or under expectation. And as you did highlight, we are very interested in having organizations contact us and say we want to try to do this and get feedback from the field. So we'll be working with uh, CCCM and also with the shelter cluster. Uh, because there's overlap in the field on these things. But I want to emphasize this. We may say shelter all the time, but this is just construction. So schools, clinics, markets, um, anything else that's, that's constructed above the ground uh, in, a, uh, uh, in a camp or an informal setting, any kind of, even, uh, for instance, even a, a communal setting, upgrading a communal setting, we can, the bill of quantities that would be used in that can be incorporated into the tool. So it's, it's quite uh, versatile in terms of looking at the CO2 equivalents. So Liz is just asking in the chat here um, that it's okay for us to assume that the tool is transferable to other camp infrastructure. Um, and I think you emphasize that in your talking points, but um, so for example, if somebody was building a church, for example, I mean, those are, or a mosque or um, a kindergarten, those are sometimes things that camp management takes on in support of the community. You think that we could use a similar type of, we could use this, this calculator? Yeah, anything that you're, essentially anything that you've developed a bill, is a, a bill of quantity for, bill of quantities for, um, which is the normal starting point for actually deciding on costing and, and construction. Um, uh, that data from that bill of quantity can go directly into the, the SMAC tool. It's what, that's what it's designed to do. And then, for instance, the SMAC tool generates three, allows you to come up with three different options as a starting point. 
so you can play around with the composition, for instance, okay, we're going to use, uh, you know, mud walls as opposed to this, or we're going to switch things around to figure out the best combination um, in, in terms of the materials you're using. And then that, if you're using Excel, uh, bill of quantities in Excel as well, you can then play with the costs and look at the best thing. I want to emphasize that this is a decision support tool. It's not the only thing by any means that you should be using and making uh, construction decisions. Um, and so it, there may be cases that you're aware that you end up with a higher uh, CO2 equivalent output as George was explaining there. Um, but once you know that, then you're more in a situation where you can start thinking about and talking about offsetting, for instance. Um, this tool isn't, doesn't reach a level of certification. So you can't go and sell your offset requirements to, to the private sector. Uh, but that is something that we're, we're looking at in the long term um, to try to figure out how to offset things. But simply, you can think about planting trees or doing other kinds of things to try to offset your carbon footprint. Yeah, it's very much aligned with the presentations that we had on our, our cross-cutting day on Thursday of, during the retreat about some of the tree planting and some of the other environmental um, choices that are being promoted in, in other settings. So th thanks for pointing that out. And the decision support tool, I like, I like that terminology. So thank you very much. This